With Prisma, it's all in one place. So within one single repository, you can define that data model, you can generate those types, and you don't have to change things in multiple like disparate areas just to get nice type safety. Hey, before we get started, I'd like to remind you that the full episode is only available to our paid subscribers. The current platforms you can subscribe to us on are Patreon, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. In the full version of this episode, we talk about Saban's opinions on NN type safety, Prisma Studio, and of course, all of our tool tips. And with that, let's get on to the episode. Hello, welcome to the DevTools FM podcast. This is a podcast about developer tools and the people who make them. I'm Andrew, and this is my co-host, Justin. Hey, everyone. Uh, today, our guest is Sabin Adams. Uh, Sabin is a developer advocate at Prisma, and we're really, really excited to have you on, Sabin. Uh, but before we dive into our questions, would you like to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Like you said, I'm Sabin Adams. Uh, I've been a developer advocate at Prisma for just over a year now, a year and a couple months. Um, it's been great. It's been awesome to dive into the community um, and just sort of see what's going on in, in the space. When you're working in like an engineering team, it's hard to get that wide view, but it's it's really cool to be able to see what's going on everywhere right now. So I'm excited to be on here with you guys. Awesome. So uh, you haven't always been a developer advocate. Uh, how did you get into first engineering and then what like prompted your transition into de developer advocacy? Yeah, so I actually I actually grew up uh, developing software with my dad. Uh, he, he was a developer since I was little, and we kind of grew up making little games together. Um, and then, yeah, I ended up going to college for marine biology, actually. And halfway through, I decided, like, what am I doing? I like, I like coding. So I uh, <laughs> ended up leaving college, actually, and have worked in various positions, doing front-end, back-end, full-stack development, um, uh, DevOps. So I've kind of been all over the place. Um, and then, you know, after around, I think it was around nine years, like nine to 10 years of that, um, I started to realize that um, a lot of what I liked doing was going into teams, documenting sort of their processes, uh, teaching, you know, newer technologies to the team members to help push the companies forward and realized dev advocacy was sort of the, a, a great transition to do more of that. Um, that way I could do sort of some of my cr more creative stuff uh, as well as the more technical, you know, coding and all that. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think finding that natural sort of that natural fit on any team is is hopefully where we all go in our careers is finding the thing that yeah yeah this this like gives us a lot of energy. That's cool how like your you and your dad like got into coding like that is that is awesome. Like I was literally thinking just the other day like my future children like if I taught them coding and told them to go to college would I tell them to go to college for coding mm. and my 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 gut reaction would be no and i think you kind of had the same gut reaction like what did you originally want to do with that degree and like what was like the final like I, I i love coding let's just go all in on that yeah well i uh I, I like coral reefs and like anything having to do with coral reefs so i was going for marine biology specifically to hopefully join a research lab um and oh, just cool. study sort of environmental effects on coral reefs um, and after going to, uh, one college for a while, for a couple semesters, and then I ended up switching to another one, um, the head of the marine biology department actually told me like, just so you know, you probably won't get a job at a lab because there's not a lot of demand for that. You'll probably be a teacher. Um, mm -hmm. and at that point, it, that was a little bit of a bummer, but I kept going, kept doing it. And then I, I was doing a lot of software development on the side just for fun. Um, and I started getting full-time job offers that were already reaching, you know, pay levels that I wouldn't have gotten after years of working in marine biology. So it was like, it was the kind of thing where it was like a, a hard choice. Like, do I follow this passion that I'm trying to like, or do I follow something I've done forever um, and just keep going with that? And so after, after talking to a couple of people, I ended up deciding to go the software development route. It's a hard decision. I had a few friends in college who were like in the same boat of like, oh, I already know how to code. I could get a job at an entry level position already. They were even going for like computer science and they're like, what am I doing here? And they all eventually ended up dropping out too. So let's circle back to Prisma developer advocacy a little more. So what is Prisma and why would I want to use it? Yeah. So, um, Prisma is a couple things, and we're actually evolving recently, so that question gets a little trickier right now. 
Um, in the past, we've primarily been known as an ORM. So, and that's our still our primary offering. We're an open source ORM. Um, our goal is good developer experience as well as uh, like complete type safety. So, what what we allow you to do is we allow you to uh, define your your database schema. We allow you to perform migrations, query your database, do any sort of operations against your database, as well as like raw queries. Um, and we've uh, specifically built this in a way to where any of those things you do result in a completely type safe experience in a TypeScript application. So how does that like compare with like traditional things? Like I'm creating a NoSQL database on Mongo. Like what's the workflow different? How, how is the workflow different? Uh, yeah, so the workflow is different because what this does is it sort of unifies your uh, the whole database setup where before uh, with Mongo, I guess it's not so big a deal because there's no schema, but with like a traditional uh, relational database, you would have to sort of define your schema in the database. Uh, you would then, uh, you know, define your schema again in your application code using uh, uh, some sort of TypeScript language so that you can define what your schema looks like in the database. And then if there's changes to that schema, you'd have to also make those same changes to uh, the representation in your code. Um, that was required to get that nice type safety uh, previously in ORMs. So there were a few outliers who covered some uh, some more detailed stuff that we're doing now. Uh, but for the most part, that was how you had to do it. Whereas with Prisma, uh, it's all in one place. So within one single repository, you can define that data model, you can generate those types, and you don't have to change things in multiple like disparate areas just to get that experience. Something I've always loved about Prisma is that the tooling is really, really good. The developer tooling, especially on around, so you sort of like, define the your your schema and kind of a DSL kind of not I guess mm -hmm. uh, and, and and it's it's I don't know the the tooling around that was always really excellent so I just have been wondering like, what is the culture for tooling inside the company how do you think about like I don't know what the developer experience is like I mean because the type <laughs> interface is really good and like it seems like developer experience is, is pretty key there so what's the culture around DX inside of it's it's taken to an extreme, I would say, uh, to where that's the top of our mind in whatever we're doing. In fact, there's things that people are, uh, it, it can go the other way too. It could be almost a negative thing sometimes. So there's things people want Prisma to support that we won't do yet because we're trying to figure out a way to do it with a good developer experience. We won't just put something out there to get it working for people. We want it to be good. So um, uh, a lot of the people that I work with come from backgrounds working in dev tooling. Um, if they weren't working in dev tooling, they were working on um, tools within larger companies. So um, it's uh, it's something that everyone is thinking about and everyone expects everyone else to be thinking about as well. That's awesome. So uh, we've talked about the database schemas a little bit, but something that's interesting about Prisma is it doesn't just support one database type. So uh, like, how does that work? work like what databases can i use and how is like this schema language uh influenced by that mm. yeah so um that that's one of the cool parts of prisma actually is that for the most part there are specific scenarios where this is not true but there's the for the most part uh the schema language isn't affected by that for there's usually uh when you're setting up your schema you get to define what sort of database provider you're using um, say you're using postgres for example you can define your schema. And then oftentimes it's as easy as switching that provider key to MySQL or Mongo uh, to switch to a different database. There's specific features of the individual databases that make that vary, of course. So um, our tooling will tell you when that happens. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's pretty much the same. We support Mongo, uh, MySQL, Postgres, and there's other ones too. There's a whole long list of them and I haven't memorized all of them, but most of the traditional rel relational databases you're going to work with. That's really awesome. Uh, I mean, just touching back on the DSL for a second, the, building an ORM is hard. And like anybody who's ever tried to do this or has like used ORMs know that they can be kind of inconsistent. Um, and sometimes gonna, it's hard to get them to do the exact thing you want or generate the exact SQL you want. So um, how do you, especially when you're thinking about multiple databases, how do you provide sort of like clarity and consistency in this DSL is like, do y'all have like a, I don't know, some sort of, uh, 
like guidelines or rules that you govern about like here's here's what we do when we add new features or here's how we think about consistency across databases and all that stuff yeah 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 definitely we do we um in fact our engineering team is split up into a bunch of smaller engineering teams that have specific focuses and we have an entire team of a couple of people that are completely focused on schema language changes. So if anything ever requires a change to that schema language, it goes through them. They write out docs and specs on it. We verify that it won't break anything that exists already. Um, and uh, the shape of that is something we very tightly govern. Um, Prisma, if you weren't aware, comes very much from a, like a GraphQL background. And we try to treat the Prisma schema the same way GraphQL schemas were treated before, where they were um, a strict set of rules that you had to keep to. Um, and you didn't really change unless it was absolutely necessary to add a new feature or something. So one thing I like about the schema uh, stuff in Prisma is how automatic it is. Like the first time I used it, I was kind of blown away that like as I'm editing, it's just like connecting all the models for mm -hmm. me. Uh, have Have you run into like situations where that like, makes things harder, I guess. Like, do you feel feel like that's a net good? Does it lead to discoverability or does it like maybe even hurt that at the start? Um, honestly, I think it, I, I've only seen it as a net good. I haven't found a scenario where someone sort of complained that, you know, the tool under the hood was doing stuff for them. Um, there are specific like really niche data requirements where you have to have specific join tables. You have to have things working in a specific way. Um, and even there, uh, you can still represent those in your Prisma schema. It just might be different than what we have in our docs, but there's almost always a way uh, to set up your data how you need to. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so not to jump too far ahead, but you are working on something new. Uh, it's advertised on the site. Uh, so what is uh, Prisma Accelerate? Can you give us the scoop? Yeah, so Prisma Accelerate... Um, uh, I guess just for some context first, we have what we call a Prisma Data Proxy, uh, and that's already out and available to use. And what this gives you is like uh, connection pooling so that from a serverless or edge environment, you can connect through this as a proxy server uh, to access traditional non-scaling relational databases from a serverless setting where you might scale to infinity. Um, what Accelerate does is it builds upon this um, specifically for people uh, working at the edge where when you connect through Accelerate and you run queries, you can define on a per query basis how you want that data to be cached. And not only is it cached, but it's cached globally uh, on Cloudflare's uh, worker network. So it gives you really, really quick sub 10 millisecond queries for the most part. Um, I say for the most part because it's sometimes even significantly lower than 10 milliseconds um, uh, on, on the edge, which currently uh, is mostly unheard of um, in this way, because what we consider this is a specialized cache where you're not just uh, caching everything that goes in and out of the, the query engine, you're caching differently per query. That's that's really awesome. That reminds me, so I think Planet Scale has a similar kind of feature that they, they, they did, like a global yeah. query optimizer. Um, and just while we're on the the note, something that I've always wondered, and we ask a lot of dev tools companies this, especially ones that do a lot of open source. And when I think about Prisma, I think about sort of this rich open source history. Um, what is how does Prisma position itself in the market to like, you know, be a profitable organization? Because it's like mm -hmm. these dev tools are all great, but you have to pay people a salary. So That's it's right. like, what do you kind of do to to keep the lights on? What are the product offerings there? Yeah, so so far we've been mostly uh, funded. Uh, we have uh, a really great um, uh, board of investors who have like seen our vision and our, our vision of our products moving forward and um, have trusted that we'll build those. And so that's been really great. Um, uh, the data platform that I just mentioned and Accelerate are examples of paid products that are going to be out. Um, and that's where we'll be uh, starting to generate some income. We already have because of those, and it's been really great. Um, we... The, we, we have a plan ahead of us to release uh, a couple of different products. I, I, I'm struggling to find the words because they are fairly secret at this point, but we have a sure, couple sure, of things yeah, coming totally out understand. Um, that will be sort of our, our, our money makers, our, our more commercial offering. And it's very exciting. There's a lot of cool stuff coming ahead. 
Yeah, I, I think that serverless offering is a great first step because mm -hmm. we've had a bunch of service people on in the past and I ask them like, oh, what do you use for your database? And it's like, oh God. <laughs> and then they start talking about Fauna or something that's like this completely new database. And mm -hmm. it's just like, oh, that's such a huge lift. The yeah. fact that there's a way to easily do this now is such a boon. Like I personally have a website where I was like, okay, let's try serverless. And then got to the end and was like, oh no, connections? Like I had to worry about this. Mm -hmm. well, as a front end developer, I didn't even know it was a thing that there was a connection limit. So like tools like this really help help developers with their everyday. Yeah, for sure. And then it, it's something that not a lot of people think about, like you just said, where uh, if you're working on a brand new project, a greenfield project, sure, it's fine to start with a, a new serverless database. But what if you're an existing company and you're wanting to, you know, push forward in the industry and move to serverless? Um, if you have a traditional relational database, it's it's not really, it's possible right now, but it's not going to be very good. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it, exciting stuff moving forward. There's a there's a lot of room for uh, for development and there's a lot of room for uh, expansion, I guess, in this in this part of the industry. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. One of the things that I love about dev tools companies in general is because they focus so much on developer experience and they're generally focused on something like this. It's like, oh, well, we'll, we'll make it easy to query something. But then getting to like some of the hard parts are like operations. It's like managing infrastructure or yeah. like setting up stuff or doing integrations and, and sort of Vercel had their big announcements this week of all their like sort of data storage options and offerings and, and that tight integration is so important and like making that user experience really good. I think there's still tons of opportunity there. So I'm excited to see what yeah. you'll do with it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So let's go into like how Prisma can help with like your developer experience while developing with your database. So like uh, generally there's two ways to get types from something that isn't, well, there's really one way to get something types from something that isn't TypeScript and that's code gen. Mm -hmm. The other uh, way you could go with this type of thing is like use a Zod like API where you kind of like build up your your database definition with TypeScript and now you don't have any generation. Mm -hmm. So uh, like what what do you see as like the pros and cons versus like code generation versus like building out a TypeScript interface that like fits the situation? Yeah, so it's a, uh... There are a couple of different pros and cons, and we see people bring this up a lot in our GitHub issues. We, we've taken the code generation route, uh, where whenever you make database changes, it'll generate a new Prisma client for you, uh, and it generates it into our node module, so you can import it as if you were importing any other uh, library. Um, this is good and bad. Uh, this is, I guess, some of the good parts about it is that you get that nice experience that you would have before, where you can import not from... Um, a uh, file path in your library, but you can import it um, directly using uh, the node modules folder. That's the default. Um, the The negative part is that it's not stored with your code. So that when you download it for say on Vercel, or if you're deploying, uh, I think Netlify has the same issue. Um, they'll preemptively sort of cache your node modules uh, so that on deployments, they're not regenerating, redownloading stuff they don't need to. And sometimes this in the past has caused problems with the Prisma client because it's generated into your node modules. So you might end up using uh, an older version. We've recently fixed those issues, but things like that are just um, little problems that arise. The same On the same strain of issues, the same thing happens with certain um, uh, tooling around monorepos. So like NX, for example, um, when you use NX, you need to define a certain specific output path for your generated client. That way it's not generated into the node modules. So um, I think that's a long-winded way of saying that generating code leads to complications that you wouldn't really expect. Um, whereas if you just have a Zod definition, uh, it sort of stays with your code base and you don't have to worry about it changing. Um, what's cool though is that the, the pluggable system that Prisma provides, the community has built Zod generators um, using Prisma client. So when you generate Prisma client, it'll also automatically generate Zod types for you based on everything. Uh, that's really cool because it allows you to generate those types and even maybe publish them uh, in a private NPM package that you could then pull into like a front end client or some other client that you're using um, and get that type safety there. Um, so there's pros and cons to both. It's just really depending on what your team looks like and what your project requirements are. 
Yeah, one of the the big benefits of the code generation is probably like the migrations wouldn't really be at all possible if that was defined via code. It's a lot simpler that like, oh, we have one schema turned into schema two, go from schema one to schema two. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you kind of explicitly have to do code generation because you're, I mean, the schema language itself is based off of a DSL. So it's like, you've got to generate something. Yeah. Um, but I, I I do think that that makes a nice trade off, at least in my experience of of using uh, of using Prisma. It's like the schema language is pretty simple to wrap your head around. The tooling is like pretty really solid. You know, like Andrew was saying, it's like automatically, you know, completing. It's like oh yeah, this field is connected to this field. You have like a many to many relationship or one to many relationship or whatever. Um, and then the code gen there just kind of feels natural, like works. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've seen a couple different times where um, people in our issues or discussions have said, oh, I don't like code generation and it's because of the schema. I don't like the schema, so I'm going to move to something else. And then uh, oftentimes they'll come back a couple months later and be like, oh, it, it clicked. I get it now. I like it. So it's like it's the kind of thing where it is a mind shift because there's not a lot of other people doing this thing right now. And you really have to try it and actually work with it for a little bit to realize the benefits that you're getting. Yeah, something always I, I you know, going back to like the comparison with GraphQL. Something I always appreciated about GraphQL is like you define your whole schema on the server or whatever, and you know you have this like complex representation of what the reality there is. But it generates out this like really nice document for you. Mm. Um, and while there were some people who did like, oh yeah, I want to like a clean English. Uh, schema that like generates out like handlers and stuff and that got really complicated mm -hmm. but overall I think the just having an artifact that you can look at and very neatly especially on like some smaller screen real estate kind of see what's going on and see the relationships between things that's huge mm. it's yeah. huge because I mean you know code is is written to be read <laughs> so <laughs> you know that's that's massive yeah absolutely and I, um, before I was actually working at Prisma I worked at a company and we were setting up microservices um, and uh, all running on Node.js and TypeScript and we were using Prisma. And it was really cool because when new developers came on board, they could just pop open our, our Prisma schema files and sort of generally see like, this is the sort of data this microservice uh, uses. This is how it relates to everything else. And it's all on one page um, where you can sort of make those connections really easily. So sometimes we would even give it to like a product manager who wanted uh, to see which data we're, we were accessing in the service and what it sort of relates to and does. Um, and with the schema and some comments in the code, it was easy enough for even a non-technical person to go in and, um, and see what's going on sort of there. Like you're saying, there's a lot of buzz that's around Vercel right now, especially in Next. Um, you know, kind of tying the our topics together a little bit. How has how has Prisma been thinking about you know end to end type safety, if if at all, and integration with these sort of like newer uh, newer frameworks like or newish frameworks like Remix and and Next. You know, this like next generation of like back end for front end kind of frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. How are y'all? What is your strategy for integration there? Yeah, so integration wise, um, honestly, we haven't had to do a whole lot in that area just because um, even if you look at the Remix docs, if you look at the next docs, um, Prisma's kind of already ingrained in there. They're, we're in their documentation, sort of the default to use. Um, the type safety just kind of works with them just um, by the nature of how it's built. What we have had to focus a lot on um, as people move towards these new paradigms of deployment, that, that's mostly where we're, we're being focused right now is these uh, serverless and edge deployment models require us to rethink sort of how our ORM works, how our products work, and adjust them to get them working properly in these settings. So what kind of a, what kind of adjustments? I mean, what does that, what does that look like? Yeah, um, a, a lot of it recently has been uh, performance changes. So uh, you, you might have seen, I, I wrote a couple of articles recently that I put out that were really focused on uh, how we've been changing Prisma to uh, to be more performant, especially around cold starts. The way Prisma was built originally, we were more focused on GraphQL. In fact, we used to be another company called GraphQL. Um, and sort of the underlying technologies that we use in our Prisma client um, used GraphQL um, specifically within the engines that generate and run your queries. Uh, this turned out to be really slow. And as 
people started deploying more and more at serverless, it became more and more apparent how slow that actually was. Um, so our focus has been sort of ripping that out, replacing it with a new protocol that's in preview right now. It's been doing really, really well, um, as well as just other little findings as we're diving into research um, into the serverless and edge environments of how to like tweak the way we um, manage the code even and how we generate our assets in a way that works quicker in the serverless runtime. I forgot all about GraphCool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't around for those times, but I remember hearing about it. And uh, yeah, it's 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 old history at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one piece of feedback I've heard when talking about Prisma to other people is that the way it builds queries can sometimes like not be performant. Like I'm, I'm wholeheartedly a front end developer. And when I got into the back end code here at Descript, I was writing terribly unperformant, uh, SQL queries. Mm. So what does Prisma do anything to help build like more performant queries as I'm using the interface? Yeah. So when, when we generate queries, the logic behind that, that generates those, we put a lot of work into trying to generate the most performant queries we can, um, we, we've gotten this feedback a lot as well. And it is a tricky one because there's a couple of different aspects to this. Um, and I think anyone at Prisma will tell you that we don't generate the most performant queries because just by default, an ORM can't really handle every possible scenario. You know what I mean? Like if you're using a query builder, um, like, like Next or like Drizzle, for example, you're going to get probably a more performant query generated because you're explicitly defining it. Um, our layer of abstraction over it sort of um, intentionally takes away that control from you so that you don't have to worry about it. Um, however, that being said, we are focusing, now that we've gotten through this cold start performance um, sort of initiative, um, our goal right now is to speed up query performance by generating more performant queries. I have heard it, uh, a lot of this happened before I was around at Prisma, but I've heard it said by a couple of the uh, product managers who've been around a little bit longer than I have that when we were first developing this, we were really focusing on potentially large queries and optimizing for really heavy queries, uh, basically for large enterprises who are running uh, pretty heavy queries. Uh, that's great. Uh, those queries are going to run fast. A lot of the ways we generate, like uh, we don't use joins, we do like subsequent data waterfall sort of selects. Um, people have complained about that. We did it that way so that in a larger query, um, it would be more performant because that ends up being more performant in larger queries. Um, but we've realized recently that um, we focus so much time speeding up these uh, this sort of like edge case where it sort of leaves the the majority of the queries behind a little bit. So we may be saving you know a couple hundred milliseconds on the really expensive queries, but it's making the the smaller queries uh, a little bit slower than even those were. Uh, so we're sort of shifting that focus back to where we need to uh, sort of find the, the right balance in the best of both worlds to make sure both are performing properly. I know that was probably a longer response than you were looking for, but uh, that, yeah, that's that's sort of our, our, our goal right now. This is always a trade-off with an ORM, though. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like you... You either have to build your interface such that it's like it is a query builder, essentially. You're just like a thin wrapper over SQL, or... Mm -hmm you know, you have to sort of like deal with those performance concerns because it's hard yeah. to get both of those. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see. Uh, just a, a general question here. What do you think are some like really, really interesting, really under uh, advertised features of Prisma? What are things that like get you really jazzed that you feel like not enough people know about? <laughs> yeah. Um... Uh, this one is something that I think people know about, but don't use enough. Uh, and that is interactive transactions. Um, not a lot of tools, actually. If you, if you go around and look at the other ORMs uh, that are out there in this ecosystem, not a lot of them allow you to run interactive transactions. Um, and I feel like the fact that we offer it uh, isn't quite enough yet. We need to advertise it more so that people start realizing this is why you might need interactive transactions, because it can really save, save you on a lot of things. So let's start here. I have no clue what an interactive transaction is. Okay. okay. Why, why, would, why would I want one and how is it cool? Yeah. So um, interactive transactions allow you to basically batch different sets of queries into, uh, into one large query that could be rolled back if it fails. 
So in in this sense, it would be say you have like an email sign up flow. Um, you sign up a user, you send them out an email, and maybe you store a couple of other things. Maybe you update some analytics uh, in your back end, and it's all going to be run in a series of different queries. Um, but if any one of those steps fails, you don't want any of it to happen. So what you could do with us is we have a uh, interactive transaction function where you can pass it in a callback, basically. You can run a set of Prisma queries. You could do any application logic within the JavaScript there um, to update values, massage your data, um, and then update more in the database. Um, and then if anything fails, we, there's a rollback piece of it where you could say, okay, everything I just told you to do, don't do it anymore. Um, so it allows you that flexibility to uh, batch multiple operations. And it also, since it runs it as one individual transaction, if you're doing like a mass update or something, and you're going to be updating a lot of data, you can run it within one of these transactions. That way it's not a bunch of, um, a bunch of consecutive queries taking up a lot of your, your, uh, your IO. It's instead just one large transaction to the database. Uh, does that make yeah, sense that or is any sense. of that confusing? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, that made, made, made a bunch of sense. I think I've actually used those before in our own okay. code base. Uh, they're just Postgres tasks is yeah, what I, yeah. I knew them by. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I can. I see how those are super useful. Like, uh, if you're doing a bunch of things in a row, there's such a large chance that things will change out from underneath you. Mm. Uh, do you guys provide any like tooling to help like kick me in that direction? Like an ESLint rule that's like, oh, you called the database three times in a row. Use a use a, a transaction dummy. Uh, we don't actually. We have a a little ESLint plugin actually that's kind of in the works. We had a couple people working on it, and right now it's sort of under my ownership. I haven't really done too much on it yet. <laughs> but what we're looking for is to 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 provide a lot of these things. Like a good example is um, when you do a create with Prisma, by default, it returns you all the fields that you created. Um, if you're working, which God forbid, hopefully you're not, but if you're working in a company who has a table that has like 100 fields, which is more common than you'd think, um, and you create a record, you don't necessarily want to send all 100 of those fields back over the network. So like the ESLint plugin we have for that right now uh, tells you, hey, when you do a create statement, you have to provide a select statement and pick what you want back. Um, so we, we do have some of that, but nothing quite towards the transactions yet. We're sort of defining what we want to do with it right now. It seems like a great start, though, because mm -hmm. like, as I've said a few times already, I'm a stupid front end developer and I'm not going to think about any of these things. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's the mindset we try to take when we design these APIs and stuff is that we want to assume that the developer doesn't know what they're doing, which is usually not the case. But it, even when you do know what you're doing, it's helpful to, to just have that assume that you don't. Yeah, I mean, try to do the right thing by default. Give people good feedback, you know, mm. in the common case. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I think um, um, another feature that is newer to Prisma, but I think uh, it really gets me excited is our Prisma client extensions. It sort of expands upon what middleware used to be for Prisma client and allows you to extend the client. Um, so you can add your own functionality. You can add your own sets of queries. Um, in the past, you would basically get our set of functions that were defined in our API, but now you can actually uh, intercept those or add to those um, and create your own. And I think that's a really cool feature. We've seen people use it already um, to, to build some cool stuff. We use it to build our like Accelerate extensions. It's basically just a really glorified um, uh, Prisma client extension. So these are runtime extensions, right, to the Prisma client yeah. library? Oh, yeah. Great, great, great. Uh, what, so... Way back earlier, you talk, You were talking about people building Zod uh, adapters onto like code gen for Prisma. Is that is there is there like a a plugin system to hook into the generator too, or is or are they just doing their own thing? Yeah. So uh, what we actually allow you to do is build your own generators. Your Prisma schema file can have multiple generator blocks, um, and basically, if you define your own generator that fits with our uh, with uh, I guess the requirements of our generator system, it will automatically run through all of those and generate your code for you. Um, it's not very documented right now. It's not super well documented. We have a couple of uh, really, I guess, advanced users who've sort of picked apart how the system works and figured it out. Uh, we need to get it documented more. I think we're sort of just waiting on engineering to make sure that things are like, uh, you know, going to be good and going to stay the same. But um, 
yeah, it, it is definitely possible right now. There are resources to help you get started. It's just not in our official docs yet. There's like, I'm, I'm surprised. It's like, there's actually a lot of generators. <laughs> yeah. And like... we have, uh, if you go on prisma.io slash ecosystem, uh, that might be where you're looking right now. Um, there's a thing to submit your own generators and packages and extensions on the top. We, we have a lot of stuff in the pipeline there that we haven't even added yet. Cause we're sort of going through and looking at them. Um, the, the community is really like taking this feature and just took off with it, like places we didn't expect them to. And it's, it's really cool to see. Are there any specific examples that you're like, you saw those and you're like, wow, I can't believe someone did this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, th there's a couple actually. Uh, one of the ones that gets me the most excited is that someone built uh, a, a tool, an extension basically that helps you generate the scaffold for your own generator. So someone basically a CLI tool to start your own generator and it gives you docs on how to, how to do it. So that that's really nice. We didn't build that. A community member took it upon themselves and that was really cool. Um, aside from that though, for actual like tools with, with Prisma, um, we have uh, somebody, I forget what it's called now. I'm trying to look for it, but I'll find a link some other time. Um, somebody built a visual schema builder where you can basically drag and drop elements onto the screen. Um, oh, and it cool. builds a, a schema. It's, it's really cool. Um, th these people are doing awesome stuff. Um, some other person built a, uh, entity, what's it called there? I can't remember what it's called. Oh, an entity diagrams, uh, where you can basically, when you generate Prisma client, it also generates an entity diagram based on your schema. And that, that's really cool. Cause then you could just, uh, pass that off, host it somewhere and people can see what your, what your schema looks like. Yeah, that's awesome. It's so cool to see what people will do when you give them pl plugins to play yeah. around with. <laughs> the creativity is wild. You, you'd never think, oh, I want my database ORM to have plugins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's funny because there's also like other tools out there like Keasley who, who allow you to query databases and stuff. And because of the nature of how they're built and what they're focused on, they can do like slightly more performant queries. Um, people have actually built Prisma schema generators that generate out your Keasley definitions and types. So you can use Prisma and Keasley together now to get that nice performance while still using Prisma. Um, and I, I think that's cool. People are just hooking us up to a whole bunch of different things and it's, it's nice to see. Yeah, looking at a few other features that you have coming out in preview, there's also full text search. So mm -hmm. like, uh, what problem does this solve? Yeah, so um, this solves the problem of, if you imagine um, you're performing a query um, and you can search for substrings within a larger string, or that's just an example, but that's that's uh, the most common one, I guess. Um, currently with Prisma Client, you can't really do that. You can do a contains, um, or you could check if a string contains a certain string, but this fuzzy uh, like full text search will allow you to search across different fields with, with uh, just individual keywords, I guess. That's interesting, because that's a feature you have to normalize, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's the reason it's taken so long is because we're getting feedback from different people on different databases to make sure it's working consistently across all of them. Uh, so far, it's looking good. It's, it's getting close to, to the point where we can release it, I think, but um, it, it, it has been taking a while to make sure that everything's working right. Yeah, getting the, everything working across all the databases that you support must be like the biggest challenge of Prisma. Yeah, well, if you look at other ORMs out there in the in the uh, I guess in the ecosystem, they'll all tell you like, hey, don't support NoSQL and SQL. Just do one or the other. Like everyone thinks it's a dumb idea. Uh, I, I agree. We do it. But I totally agree. It's dumb because it adds so much to your to your development life cycle. Um, is it worth it in the end? Yes. But it, it just adds to how long features have to stay in preview for sure. Has it ever like stopped you guys from shipping a feature? You're like, oh, we can support this on Postgres, but like there is no path to support on MySQL. Yeah, there, there are a couple of those actually. Um, and I think most of them are actually documented in the docs somewhere. I'd have to find it. Um, but when you try to do something that's supported in one database and not another one, um, Prisma Schema will actually tell you, hey, this isn't supported in your database provider. You have to use MySQL to do this or something. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's a trade-off that you have to do. Uh, I mean, it, I think it's honestly fascinating that you can support so many databases anyway. Like, that's <laughs> yeah. a non-trivial non thing to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Our engineering team is is fantastic. It's awesome to see them working together and working through these issues. 
Um, it's also been really cool to see the collaboration that's been opened up with other bigger companies like Mongo, CockroachDB, things like those. If we find stuff that we need to support that isn't supported yet, these companies have been very open to us coming in and saying, suggesting stuff, and they'll just basically jump on it right away for us. So it's been really cool. What's next for Prisma? What are you guys planning? How are you going to change the industry? Yeah, so we uh, there have been a couple things that we've teased on Twitter. Uh, you may have seen some very cryptic posts on on the Twitter channel where it's like a GIF or something where we're talking about um, stuff coming up. Uh, we're we're having a new product launch and it should be um, available sometime in May. We're thinking around the middle or end of May, but um, the date's a little fuzzy, but it's, it's coming really close. Um, and we've seen a lot of people guessing as to what it's about and they're getting pretty close. It has to do with um, uh, basically uh, data, like uh, change detection on your database. Um, so if you think about like how... Uh, a Firebase or a Superbase works where you get these ni nice updates when your data changes. Um, we're headed in that direction. We we have our own spin to it and it's going to be really, really cool. Um, but yeah, that like this all leads into sort of the idea of distributed serverless systems where, we're, where Prisma is focusing. Um, so this is just one example of a product that we have in the works um, to help democratize your data in a serverless sort of distributed system. That's awesome. Is that like email notifications or like in my app, I'm getting notified, like the UI updates, whatever you can say. Yeah. Um, so it, it not email notifications. So it's going to be in your apps. This is related to querying and accessing your data. Um, okay. So think along the lines of like WebSockets, how you can like basically stream sets of data and listen and subscribe to uh, to things to get data changes. Uh, it's, it's along those lines. I'm being very cryptic. I apologize, but <laughs> uh, you'll see okay. soon enough. It's going to be very, very cool. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I got my journalist hat on. I'm digging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, let's uh, transition to tool tips. That's it for the free portion of the interview. If you want to hear a full conversation with Sabin, you'll have to become a paid subscriber. Thanks for listening. Okay. Um, that wraps it up for this week's tool tips. Uh, thanks for coming on Sabin. It was a uh, nice learning all about Prisma and all the new things that you guys got planned. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Great. Thanks for joining. <laughs>